there was one song that while I was singing, I thought to myself, I better stop because it doesn't really line up with reality in my life. And that was the song that says, you're my master, you're my king. While I was singing, I remember two parables of Jesus. One was, goes along the lines of, Jesus said, says there was a master who had a slave. And uh, the slave would wake up early in the morning, go into the fields, work really, really hard, and come back home extremely tired. And the master said to him, you worked hard enough, you are tired, go and lie down there, put your feet on the table, watch some TV program, I'll bring you some food, don't worry. Does anyone know this parable? It's a bit different, brother. He says that after a day's work, this, must, this slave came home exhausted from the work in the field. And the master said to him, you're not allowed to lie down. First, you cook dinner for me. After that, you clean the house. And after you've done everything, you are an amazing slave. Is that what he said? He said, after you've done all of that, consider yourself an unworthy slave. Oops. Is this the Jesus we know? Because I tell you what, many times I come home and the last thing on my mind is to prepare food for Jesus. I mean, the last thing on my mind is to go and praise him and pray to him and sing songs and express my gratitude and all of that stuff. You know what I want to do? I said, I'm so tired. I mean, I laid 20 meters of tiles today. I work so hard. All I want to know is just grab my Coke and watch a footy game and watch TV and, and do all that. Let me go to another parable. Matthew chapter 24. It says that there was another master who was going away for a long time. And before he left, he called his servants and he gave each servant a talent. Now a talent is not a gift, as some people might think. It's not if Jesus said, okay, I'm going to give you a, a, a talent, so you, a gift, so you'll be able to sing, you'll be able to recite poems, you'll be able to do whatever. A talent is a, is a, a quantity measured in silver. And um, he told each one of them to do something with the talent they received. And he went away and he told them, because when I'm going to come back, I'm going to ask an account of you, what you have done with the talents you have received. And it says that when the master came back, the one that received 10 talents doubled them. The one that received five doubled the five talents. But there was one master who received only one talent, which is about 35 kilograms of silver. And while the master was away, he dug a hole and he put all that silver and he covered the hole. And when the master came, he said, what have you done with, with, with the amount of money that I've given you and I've asked you to invest them? He says, oh, I knew that you are a harsh, a very hard master. You sometimes want to get money out of stone. You, and he started to tell, you know what I've realized? That, what was Jesus trying to say? That all of us who have come to know the Lord Jesus, we have all received a measure of grace, a measure of the Holy Spirit, a measure of faith, we received a measure of his life in us. And he's expecting us to do something with that. With that measure of faith, maybe not all of us have received 10 talents of faith. Maybe we received one talent, a small measure of faith. Others a, a small measure of grace. Others a small measure of the Holy Spirit. But we all have received something. And the, 
and the master is waiting on us to do something with what we have received. Now, why didn't that slave do anything with that measure of money or talents? You know what? Listen to what he says, you know. The reason why I haven't done nothing with what you've given me is because of my opinion of you. I thought that you are a hard master. And I want to say to all of you here, because this is what I've seen in my heart, the way you're going to serve Jesus is equal to your opinion about him. If you think that he's a hard master, that he wants you to do all these things and all that stuff. And you know what he says? I knew you were a hard master and I was scared. scared. I was afraid. If the motivation of us serving Jesus is fear, we're not going to get too far. The motivation should be what? Love. Love. Amen. Our opinion of him matters a lot. If we think... Because if we think that he's a hard master, we're going to say, you're not fair the way you deal with us. You're not fair the way you allow these things in my life. You're not fair about all these things. So, next time we sing this song, you're my master. Does that really align with the way we see ourselves an unworthy slave? Is that the way we deal with what he's given us? with that measure of talent, measure of grace, Holy Spirit, measure of faith in our lives? Or do we find ourselves many times too tired to pray or too discouraged to even do anything or even not thinking that he is worthy of all of our, everything that we must do for him because he is a hard master? So ask yourself this question this morning when we sing this song, you're my master. You, my king, are we really that servant that Jesus is looking for and that he gave his life for? So let's ask the Holy Spirit this morning to change our opinion of Jesus because he is worthy of everything. And Sam says that many times. He is worthy overall. But let's ask that the Holy Spirit will do this mighty work in us, transforming and changing our lives. Now, don't have my phone with me. What's the time? Don't worry about okay. Okay. I wasn't really sure of the message that the Lord laid on my heart for this morning. But as we were going through the service this morning, and especially uh, the last words that Sam pronounced over here when he said, is anyone in need of the touch of Jesus? It really... Uh, brought it home for me that this message this morning is for us, for this church. Because I titled my message this morning, Touched by the Royal Family. You know, a week ago, I was watching snippets on TV about the <coughs> fact that the Queen has died. And um, I saw millions of people in England lining the streets of London um, being desperate to touch or to be touched by the royal family. I remember when Diana was alive, Princess Diana, everywhere she went, people were dying to touch Diana. And after she died, by the way, I was in Paris, not far away from the tunnel where the accident happened, right on the night when Diana died. I was on a holiday with my wife. And uh, we heard the police, we heard the sirens, we didn't know what happened. And one week after we left Paris, we went to London. And uh, we were walking through the parks, uh, the castles there. And um, as soon as we entered the, uh, the park, we saw flowers and bouquet of flowers to about that height, covering the whole park for kilometers. I think there were millions and millions of flowers. Everybody came to pay their respects to Princess Diana, and everybody had cards and placards that says, Diana, you touched my life. And I realized 
that indeed the British people are extremely fascinated with the royal family. Extremely fascinated. I mean, when I used to live in Romania, they used to get me out of my classroom to go on the streets in Bucharest and express my adoration for the supreme leader of Romania, Ceausescu. And we were forced <coughs> to sing out these slogans about Ceausescu, the supreme father of Romania and all of this stuff. But I hated it. Oh, man. No one, <laughs> we were forced to go there. But in England, no one forced these people to go out on the streets and, and wanting to touch the royal family. Or when, when Prince William came to Australia 20 years ago, whenever that was, people in Melbourne were going and, and pushing their way in just to touch Prince William. I have to say something to you right now in this morning. The royal family, they're nothing but mere mortals. They can do nothing for you. You can go and touch them or allow yourselves to be touched by them or something, they, they, they'll do nothing for you. But I want to speak today about the real royal family who can really touch your life and can really change you. And when I mean the real royal family, I mean God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, Jesus Christ. This, because the Bible says that He is the King of Kings. And if you open with me to um, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, I want to show you why Jesus can touch your life in the way that no one can. And Jesus' touch can really change your life and transform your life. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says this. Let's start with verse 37. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So we find out from this verse that God the Father had anointed Jesus with power and authority, and he went around doing good and healing all of those who are under the power of the evil one, which is the devil. So, Jesus was the only person on earth that has been anointed by God the Father with power and authority in such a way that his touch and whoever touched him received such power or influx of authority in their lives that they were healed, they were set free, and their lives transformed. Open with me to a few more verses because I want to show you something. Luke chapter 6 verse 17 to 19. Luke chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Luke chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Matthew chapter 14, verse 36. Matthew chapter 14, verse 36. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Mark chapter 3, verse 10. It 
Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him. Uh, sorry, verse 10. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, uh, ah, for he healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. So what we see here, we see groups of people, might be hundreds or in the thousands, pushing their way in just to touch Jesus. And as soon as they touched Jesus, the Bible says that a power went out of him that either healed them of their diseases or set them free from demonic oppression and possession or set them free from their whatever bondages they had in their lives. Because God the Father has anointed Jesus with power and authority. And everywhere he went, he says that people recognized him. As soon as they saw him, they recognized this is Jesus. This is the one that has been anointed by God the Father. And his touch means something in my life. And I want to talk, I'm not sure if you've seen, the reason why I read so many verses, because I wanted to show you something. That all these people who desperately went around trying to touch Jesus had something in common. And what they had in common was this. First of all, they all had a need in their lives. Secondly, they were all desperate. And thirdly, they all believed that if they managed to push through the crowds and touch Jesus, their lives will be transformed. This is very important. They all, they all had a need. They were all desperate, and they all believed that they were, if they were able to touch Jesus, their problem will be resolved. And I want to give you an example that we find in, um, in uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 24 to 34. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, because you know what it's all about. Chapter, Mark chapter 5, verse 24 to 34. And it starts with... Uh, this, this sick woman who had a flow of blood from, from her body. And the Bible says that she tried many doctors. She went to all of the specialists in the area. Not only that, the Bible makes it very clear that she has used up all her money trying to get healed. She went to all the doctors wasted all her money trying to be healed and the problem was not going away. And she came to Jesus. And from what I see, she came to Jesus because she was desperate. And I want to tell you exactly how desperation looked for her. She realized one thing, that if this doesn't fix the problem, she will die. That's how desperate she was. If she doesn't touch Jesus, she will die. She was very desperate. So Jesus was her last resort. resort. But you know what she found out? That even though Jesus was her last resort, Jesus was her best resort. Now, let's bring it home to us. Sometimes we go on for years allowing a certain sin in our life. Do you know why we, don't, why we allow that sin in our life? I'll tell you why. First of all, we cannot be desperate until we see our need. And we're not desperate enough until we realize that that small sin in our lives produces in us a flow of the power of God from us and ultimately that small sin will produce in us spiritual death. That's why we're not desperate. Because we think that small sin is not important. Many of us we never experience that miracle touch 
of Jesus' power in our lives because we're not desperate enough. And we're not desperate enough because we don't see our need. People sometimes don't want the righteousness of God that they receive through touching Jesus and, 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 and coming as a slave to the master. You know why? Because they think that their righteousness is good enough. They think that their righteousness is good enough to take them into eternity, into heaven. They don't see their need for Jesus' righteousness. That's why they're not desperate enough. When we become desperate like that, and I've seen, you know, I'm not putting down the people who wanted to go and touch the royal family. And I've seen this in India as well, where millions of people in India, they desperately go to touch a guru for healing, to touch the garments of a guru or something like that. When I looked at them, you know what? You know, I noticed the reason why these people do these things is because they are desperate. They live miserable lives. They have no joy. They have no hope. Some of them are sick and they're looking for something to change their circumstances, something to give them a, a, a glimper of, of, of hope, of joy, of, of something in their lives. And many of them are willing to pay a lot of money just to be touched by a guru in India. Jesus said, I don't need your money. All who are thirsty, what? Come to me and I will give you, what? The waters of life. I will give you all that. You know what I've realized with that woman that had a, a, a flow of blood from her body that were making her sick to the point of losing her life? It says that she pushed her way through the crowd. Now, sometimes we have very crowded lives. We do so many projects. We have so many things. We, we, and I realize that if we really want to experience the touch of Jesus, we need to push our way through the crowd things in our lives. Push them aside. Say to God, I don't need this program, TV program. I don't need to watch this movie. I don't need to go there. I don't need to invest there. I don't need to do all these things. Why? I'm pushing my way in. What? To touch and be touched by Jesus. But because we don't have that desperation, we don't see a need to push through all these things in our lives. It's all about seeing your need that will cause the desperation in your life. You don't see your need. You don't become desperate. If you don't become desperate, maybe you will never experience the touch of Jesus. But he is the only one anointed by the Father. No one else. And there are millions and millions of people throughout history who can testify that the touch of Jesus changed them completely. And you can see through the pages of the Bible that everyone that came to Jesus in this way, their lives were transformed. We're talking a lot about being born again. And we will talk about these things. We need to be born again. We need to be touched by Jesus. But I don't realize, and I can't understand, how can we say we have been born again and not be changed? Because from what I see in the Bible, no one who has ever met Jesus remained the same. Every single one was transformed to the point where uh, Zacchaeus said, if I have ever cheated anybody, what will I do? I will pay him back four times as more. And half of my money I will give to the poor. I don't care. See, you say you are born again, but you are the same person as before. You love money like before. You watch the same TV programs, but you say you've been born again. Have you really met Jesus? Because when you meet him, he is the anointed one that changes your life. And we need to, to be true to ourselves this morning and say, I don't see this need. And I'm not desperate. 
and I'm not changed. Maybe we have not met Jesus yet. Because whoever meets the real Jesus, he says people were so desperate just to touch his garment. And this woman touched the garment of Jesus, seeing her need, being desperate, realizing that she will die. And she touched Jesus. And out of the thousands of people that were pushing and shoving, Jesus stopped. And you know what he said? Somebody touch me. And the disciples said, oh, you know, Jesus, it's kind of hard to, <laughs> I mean, maybe hundreds of people touch you. Everybody was pushing and shoving. You know what Jesus said? I know that somebody touched me. Why? Because I felt a prickle here. <laughs> Or somebody really elbowed me in my back. You know what Jesus said? A power has come out of me. Brothers, in a nutshell, a real Christian life is someone who experienced the touch of Jesus and a power from Jesus came into his life. That's the real Christianity. It's not what I struggle to do and how I'm trying to perfect my manners. And, and no, you have felt that a power from Jesus has come out of him and has come into your life through the Holy Spirit. And that's Christianity in a nutshell. And it's not longer you, it's him that lives down in you. And that's, that's how it is. But anyway, Jesus wanted to clear a few things out. And he stopped and he looked at the woman. And the woman said, okay, Jesus, it was me. I don't think that Jesus was trying to put that woman on the spot and bring shame to her. But Jesus wanted to make something very clear for all of us. Because you know what Jesus said to her? Woman, it is your faith that has healed you. And I think that's rather important. You know why? Because most religions in the world, they have all sorts of rituals and artifacts. And they say to you, if you touch this, if you rub this crystal ball, if you touch this statue of Mary, if you do all that stuff, you will be healed. Jesus wanted to make sure that it was not the touching of his garment that healed this woman. He was the touch of faith. Amen. So, we have to see our need. Then we become desperate. Then we need to see how important it is to push through all the crowded things in our lives, to make Jesus our main priority in our lives. And there's one more ingredient. We need to have faith that when we touch Him, he is the anointed one and something will happen. You know, I know, you know why I know that something will happen? Open with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 42. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cured. You know what a man with leprosy looked like in those times? He was not allowed to join any community. He was not allowed to mingle with any group of people. He was an outcast from society. And if he needed to go into the village, because they were, they were forced to live outside the villages, not within the community, not to spread the leprosy. And if he needed to come back into the village to buy something, if he was to approach any groups of people, he needed to shout out 
unclean, unclean, run away from me, unclean. And no one would touch these people because they were considered unclean and dangerous. And this man who has never been touched in his life, can you imagine the emotional baggage of this man? Someone who probably never told him, I love you, and touched him. Somebody who was never able to join any community. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, are you willing to touch me? <laughs> and Jesus said he was moved with compassion. And he said, I'm willing to do whatever, what no one was ever able to do to you, to touch you. <laughs> and he says, he touched him. And he was clean. You see, sometimes we like to linger in that sin for years and years because it brings us some pleasure. We don't see the danger of it. We don't see that that sin causes us a leak in our lives. You know, sometimes the brothers say, and they, they sort of um, warn us. And they say, brothers, you've been at the camp. You've been on the mountain high. Be prepared now to taste the valley. But you know what I think? I think the reason why we are not always full of joy and filled of the Holy Spirit is because we leak. We come here Sunday, we sing the songs, you my master, you my king, put our hands high, and tomorrow morning, we again empty, discouraged, full of leprosy, and all that stuff. Let's ask the Lord Jesus, Jesus, am I a, a leaking vessel? Whatever you put in me Sunday morning, it's gone by the night. You know why I think that we all, Sam said, all of us can be touched by Jesus this morning. Amen. And I agree, all of us can be. Providing we see our need, providing we're desperate, and providing we are willing to push through everything in our lives and make him number one priority. Amen. And we can experience what this woman has experienced. I felt that a power has come from Jesus into my life. And that's what we need. We need the touch of Jesus in our lives, in all three areas of our lives. When I say three areas, I mean physical, emotional, and spiritual. We need the touch of Jesus. And I want to finish off by saying this. I said to you that I know that Jesus wants to touch us. Why? Based on these single verses here. When that man came desperate to Jesus and says, Jesus, are you willing to touch me? Jesus says, he was moved with compassion. The reason why Jesus wants to touch us, because he was touched by our weaknesses. That's what we read this morning in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, that he was touched with our infirmities. He was touched by our weakness. And not only that, there's one more thing that touches Jesus like no one other. If you open with me to Jonah chapter 3 and 4. Jonah is one of these books that is very hard to find. Yes. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious 
and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. You see, it's very hard to understand the book of Jonah. I mean, everything is okay up to chapter 4. When you see Jonah's attitude, you, you sort of get extremely confused. But I'm not going to preach on Jonah now. But if we can understand what Jonah was trying to tell God when God said to Jonah, I want you to go there, because many people probably have a wrong impression about Jonah. And I don't want to go into another sermon now, but I think that what Jonah was trying to say to God was this, God, you're going to waste your grace on these people. You're going to be merciful to them. You're going to be loving to them. And they don't deserve it. And you will see that what I'm saying to you is right. You will see that you will have mercy on them and not before they will turn their back again on you. And he says that Jonah went up on a mountain and he said, God, I'm going to prove it to you. You just be merciful to them and see what happens. And that's exactly what happens to many of us. God is merciful, loving, compassionate. And after a while, we turn back to our own ways. And that's, see how the book of Jonah finishes. It's an amazing book in many ways. But anyway, all I want to say, I want to finish with this. Jesus is touched by three things. If we need to see our need, if we need to become desperate, and if we need to push our way through the crowd of things in our lives to get to the touch of Jesus, the Bible also says that Jesus was also touched by three things in, in the human being. First, he was touched with our infirmities and weaknesses. Secondly, he was touched by our repentance. And thirdly, he was touched by our faith. Remember on a few occasions that he says that he was amazed by the faith that he saw. So I tell you what, if we do our part, God promises that he will do his part. If we truly repent this morning, God said to Jonah, do you see how these people repented? I'm touched by their repentance. And if we're desperate, God will not be, you know, unloving towards us. So let's ask the Lord Jesus this morning, at least be sincere with him and say, God, I don't see a need in my life this morning. But if you do see a need, ask the Lord, Lord, make me desperate. Amen. Show me my need, make me desperate and help me to repent thoroughly in my life because I am desperate for your touch. And may God bless you, brothers.